The Diary, A Ghost Story. It's never easy going through the things of a loved one who has died. You always hear stories of relatives fighting over treasures or property or money. But it's never like that, not in real life. In real life, it's just painful. I'm driving north from Princeton, Minnesota to go through the things of my aunt who has died. Mavis, her name was. I was her favorite. I'd come to visit her every summer for a week or two when I was little. I told my mother it was because I hated the heat. We lived in farm country, and Mavis up on the border where the lakes are cool and the breezes blow in from Canada all summer long. I told my mother that, and it was true to a point. But the real reason I wanted to visit Aunt Mavis every summer was that she was a card. Just a sip. That's all. You're only 11. That was Mavis giving me my first taste of wine. That's enough, young lady. You'll be a lush if you're not careful. First taste of wine, first taste of whiskey, movies my mother wouldn't let me see, advice on boys. Don't show too much interest at first. Just glance over, meet his eyes for a moment, and then, if he's very cute, smile, then turn back and ignore him. There wasn't a question she couldn't answer, it seemed. Even when I was older. University's too big. No, 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 that's your mother talking, dear. Look, it might seem big, but it won't be that way for long. You'll find your friends, your room, your classes. Nobody goes to the whole university at once, do they? And she'd been right. I did love it there. That meant Mother had been wrong and Aunt Mavis had been right. I knew Aunt Mavis and Mother didn't get along. Sisters do that sometimes. I never asked Mother why, and I only asked Mavis once. I suppose it's silly, she'd said. But your mother took something that belonged to me once. Mom died two years ago. Surgery, infection. Dad's head is filled with lawsuits and figures and which doctors can testify on our behalf. I don't have any patience for it. So when Aunt Mavis passed... Why don't you, why don't you take care of it, hon? I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs with this. Dad never finishes his sentences anymore. So I drive north. It's ugly this spring here not even really spring yet it's just the horrible dead time as the snow melts revealing what was underneath the frost line is five feet deep this far north so it'll be weeks before the grass really comes back and the trees leaf in and the real spring arrives it's as if the world has given birth to itself again and it is still fresh from the womb covered in the fluids and the violence awaiting its chance to be cleaned up and wrapped into a perfect little bundle it's so easy to look past this time of spring we all know what's coming, and that's what we focus on. We don't pay attention to the mud and the sand, the leftover death that's everywhere. We just ignore it. It's just that I can't. Not this year. at Aunt Mavis's house. It's the house she and my mother grew up in. It's big for the neighborhood. Probably too big. It was never very easy to heat. Her furniture is gone, divided up amongst the relatives, the cast-offs to the Salvation Army. The only exceptions are a small kitchen table with two chairs and the guest room, my room, which was left intact and unchanged. This is for me. I will stay in this house as I go through her things. Next to my room is Aunt Mavis's. It still smells of the lilac lotion she always used, and I'm surprised to see two of her old cotton dresses hanging in the closet. They are simple, plain. The kind she wore late in life when she was, in her own words, past the point of caring. I arrive as the sun sets on that first day. The house seems to welcome me as an old woman in a hospital bed might welcome a visitor. 
Aunt Mavis's papers had been left for me in cardboard boxes. The desk they were in, a prize now belonging to some cousin in Duluth, is gone. I'll work from the kitchen table. The next day, I begin. It only took me five minutes to find it. A black book, locking strap on the side. The gold letters on the front spelling diary had almost been worn off. I glanced at it briefly and then set it aside. I had a lot of work to do. I didn't think of the diary again until I'd worked through the morning. I was in her room and the smell of lilac perfume brought me back to it. The key was nowhere to be found. I cut the strap with kitchen shears. It gave easily like paper. It never occurred to me that there might be something wrong in this, reading my dead aunt's diary. It had no value. It held no interest for anyone but me. I suppose the only options would have been to read it or destroy it. I can't say I thought about the decision carefully. I didn't even make a decision. I just acted. I outread the light that first day. Have you ever done that? Gotten so engrossed in something that you're reading that you lose track of time? You squint harder and harder at the page until you realize you're squinting because the light is fading? Is gone? I couldn't stop reading. April 2nd. Wash day. That was Aunt Mavis when she was 13. The diary started around then. Mom made me work twice as long as Carol. Carol, that was my mother. Mother made a big deal about our fighting, like we shouldn't fight so much. Nuts, I thought, but I couldn't say it out loud. Nuts! I wonder if that was cussing in her day. Carol gets away with everything just because she's prettier, and she knows how to work Mother like an old plow horse. I wish I could deceive like Carol, but everything that comes into my head shows up on my face. I can't feel anything without Mother knowing. Carol's like an actress, a professional liar. My mother an actress? I had never thought about it before, but I began to see it. Mother always did seem so... controlled. Specific. And she always knew what I was thinking, no matter how hard I tried to hide it. Aunt Mavis had lifted a veil for me. That night I took the diary to bed and read for hours. I didn't look at the clock when I turned out the light, but I couldn't sleep, and I rose with the sun. The next day I made progress. I worked most of the morning and then sat with the diary through the afternoon. There was a lot of Aunt Mavis in that diary, a lot of the woman I recognized. But there was a lot of new things, too. A 14-year-old girl, then a 15-year-old. Her first kiss was a boy named Elmer. He smelled like Sin Sin and motor oil, and he seemed afraid of her. She was invited to the snowball dance before Carol was that year. That was a monumental event in Aunt Mavis's life worthy of two full pages in the diary. January 23rd, the day after snowball. I'm shaking all over. I can't think straight. I dropped the canned peaches helping Mom with dinner, then cut myself picking up the glass. I'm in a fog because of him. I saw him at the dance. Jenny Fulton said he was Mike Parker's cousin from Duluth, dragged along to Snowball because they had an extra ticket. His name was Robert, but he insisted I call him Robbie. But it wasn't like he was a little kid, Robbie. He seemed older even though he was only 17. He asked me to dance. Then we danced again. He got me punch and we talked. We danced seven or eight times. And by the end of that night, he was spending all the time with me. Carol came with stinky old Billy Adams, who was drunk. I could have told her he would have been. Once, 
I caught her staring daggers at Robbie and I, like I didn't have the right to have a good time if she couldn't. Like Cinderella was the only one entitled to a carriage. I looked up from the book. My mother's face popped into my head. I knew that look, that dagger look. I knew it boring into my back as I left for a date or a dance. It went like that for another day. I worked in the morning, read from lunch straight through to bed. I knew I'd catch hell at work for missing more days, but it seemed important to read the diary here in this house. I didn't know why, then. Just a feeling, I suppose. Robbie called again. A feeling that this was the only way to really know Aunt Mavis. In the dresser in my room, I had started making a little pile. A cache of things I'd wanted for myself. There was a brooch. Not expensive, not even really pretty. Just a few red imitation rubies on what looked like a silver plate pin. But it was small and elegant, and exactly the kind of thing Aunt Mavis loved. The brooch was her in my mind, so I wanted it. The evening of the third day, I went to put my watch on the table where I kept my little cash, and the brooch was gone. I didn't think anything of it. Perhaps I'd absentmindedly slipped it into my bag already and would find it when I got home. I drew a bath and carefully slipped in, making sure my hands were dry before picking up the diary. We went to Bemidji to Christmas shop. I wanted to go to Duluth, but Carol was the deciding vote. She looked right at me and voted Bemidji, which she hates. I knew she did it just for spite. I read on about sibling rivalry, the indifference of parents, her ever-growing affection for Robbie. The water wasn't that warm, but I got drowsy. I made sure the diary was safe on a ledge above the tub before I closed my eyes. In the dream, I was in the lake. It was warm, warmer than I ever remembered it. And I looked back on the beach, and Aunt Mavis was there. There was a campfire, and she was standing on the far side of it. And as I watched... Aunt Mavis walked right through the fire towards me. I was laying down in the shallows, just a few inches of water, but I couldn't move. My legs felt heavy and soft. I kept breathing harder and harder, but it wasn't enough. And she was walking towards me, and I began to realize there was something wrong with her face. She was dressed just as I remembered her. The old cotton dress, a red one with white flowers. But her face, her face was shriveled and wrinkled, and there's she got closer, I began to see that that was just a reflection of Aunt Mavis. Her face was like an apple, dried in the sun, and her hands were like claws. The fingertips were purple, and the nails were yellow and long and sharp. I woke just in time to stop the diary from falling into the tub. I was sure I'd set it back on the ledge. Sure I had. But when I woke up, it was barely teetering there, hovering over the water. I carefully dried my hands and picked up the diary with tremendous care, and I was just going to put it out of harm's way on the chair near the tub when I heard it. And I froze, and I felt the goose flesh climbing slowly from my feet to my throat, and then... I picked the book out of the water, but it was soaked. I couldn't catch my breath, just like in the dream. Something had knocked the diary out of my hand. Something had wanted it ruined. Something was in the house with me. I knew that as long as the humidity stayed low, it would be an easy thing to dry the pages. I just had to be patient, that was the key. But I kept thinking of ways to do it quicker. I even turned on the oven once before I realized what I was doing and shut it off. I didn't want to have any more dreams of Aunt Mavis. I didn't want to see her diary burned. It grew late, past midnight. I must have dropped off on the couch, but rather than dreams, I fell into a great blackness, like I was dreaming without pictures. Instead, I dreamed in sounds. I heard things. Fire, fire, burning bright. I heard her voice. Fire, fire, burning bright. And I realized that in this dream, it was as if I were blindfolded. 
and Aunt Mavis was in the room with me. I could hear her, and of course smell her lilac perfume. Fire, fire, burning bright, flames of plenty. What a sight. What, what do you want me to do? Burn. I don't understand. Burn. Aunt Mavis? I jolted awake when I heard it and ran to the kitchen. I'd forgotten the pot I put on for pasta. It had boiled dry. It was ruined. I stood in the kitchen a very long time, shaking, listening. There was nothing to hear. The diary dried out eventually, but I didn't go near it for another day. I busied myself out of doors with the garage and the garden shed, even though the seasons had turned back to winter for a day, sending my gloveless hands into fits of frigid shaking. But I had a hard time being in the house. I even went out one evening to the movies and sat alone in a half-empty theater staring at a comedy that I didn't want to see. When I was in the house, I could feel the diary from the front room. It sat on the table in the sunlight, tissue between the leaves. My sleep was haunted by more dreams. Always there was fire. And though I never saw her in the dreams, Aunt Mavis was like a presence there. I felt her nearby. I could hear her, smell her. But it was as if she refused to speak to me. I always woke with a headache, and I usually couldn't go back to sleep. The sixth night I was there, I couldn't sleep at all. So I came out to the front room. The diary was completely dry by then. The pages were still bloated and wrinkled, but it was possible to turn them. I touched it, and I opened it to a place near the back, not far from where I'd been reading when it was... when it fell into the tub. Robbie telephoned. 17-year-old Aunt Mavis. In love. We talked for almost an hour, and Carol and I had a huge fight. She claimed she was expecting a call, then she claimed she needed to make a call, then I don't know what. All I know is that she doesn't like me with Robbie. She hates me with Robbie. Three days later, Robbie's coming to visit. I'm so excited. A week. Mom insisted we take Carol to the movies with us. I was furious, but I couldn't show it in front of Robbie. Disaster. I hate her. I'll get her back for this. Another week. It's me he loves. I know it. No matter what she says, she's just a liar. And another. I came home... And Carol was on the phone, giggling and cooing. I knew who it was. I just had to pick up the extension to be sure. And on and on and on. Aunt Mavis tried to kill herself, but never got past the point of collecting sleeping pills. My grandmother found them and punished her by sending her to a psychiatrist. Carol, my mother, rode back and forth with Robbie for another six months and then went off to college. They broke up sometime thereafter. Of course, I didn't know for sure that my mother had stolen Robbie out of spite, but that's what Aunt Mavis believed. There was another year's worth of entries in the diary, each one more bitter and angry than the last. Until finally, a full year after my mother had left for college, the news came that she had met my father and was going to be married. On the day it happened... Aunt Mavis wrote this. My sister doesn't deserve happiness. My sister is a thief. She had everything, but she always wanted more. She's always wanted whatever I had. Well, I think I know what to do. I'm going to give it to her. I'm going to be the perfect sister. I'll be at her side as a bridesmaid. I'll be the perfect little aunt to her children. Because sooner or later, 
My sister is going to need me. She's going to be in poor health or in marriage trouble or something. And because I've always been so, so good to her, she'll turn to me for help. And at that moment, I will remind her about Robbie and I will turn my back and I will leave her to rot in whatever hell she's living in. As I read that, a chill ran over me. I remembered a day when my mother was in the hospital and Aunt Mavis was supposed to come to visit. When I arrived, my mother was crying. I asked what was wrong, but she said nothing. My mother died a month after that day in excruciating pain in a care center that was very likely ignoring her. Aunt Mavis had had her revenge. I closed the diary. I felt mad. Burn it. Burn it? No. No, I wouldn't. My mother may have done a horrible thing, but she was just a girl. She was 17. Mavis was in her 70s when my mother died. I stood up and looked around the house. I spoke out loud directly to her. I'm not burning it, I said. I'm not covering your sin. I'm going to show this to Dad and to my cousins and to anyone else I feel like showing it to. Do you hear me? Aunt Mavis, do you hear me? And with that, the lights went out. The fuse box was in the basement. I didn't know where the flashlights were. I remembered some candles in a drawer in the kitchen. I opened the door to the basement and walked through... Aunt Mavis never used her basement much. It was just a big empty room, dirt floor, the old oil furnace in the corner. The candle threw poor light on the stairs. I felt the cold seep into me with every step. The ground had not yet thawed outside, so I was literally descending into a room with walls of ice. At the bottom of the stairs, I looked around, trying to find the fuse box by feeble light, but the candle's rays only seemed to reach five or six feet in front of me. The only thing to do was follow the wall, inch by inch. I stepped down off the stairs. With every step, the darkness seemed to press in closer. The candle flickered now, even though I could feel no wind. I came to a corner and turned. Still no fuse box. I became aware of another sound, a pounding I could feel as much as hear. And I realized it was my own heartbeat in my ears. My eyes got cloudy. I couldn't even see my hand in front of me now, candle or not. This was crazy. This was insane. I didn't know this cellar. I didn't know this house. I could break my neck down here. And then I felt a gust of wind colder than any I had ever felt before. And the candle suddenly and completely went out. I froze to the spot, my heart pounding louder and louder until I was ready to scream at it for silence. Slowly, cautiously, I turned around and began to move back the way I'd come, my hand brushing against the wall as I went. The cold stayed with me. I felt it sticking in my middle like a knife. I walked, hesitantly, slowly. I came to the corner and turned, and I kept walking, a little faster, my heartbeat in my ears, my breathing fast and shallow. I couldn't catch my breath. I didn't know how many steps it had been since I turned the corner, but the stairs had to be right there in front of me. With my other hand, I reached out, groping for them, reaching into the blackness, desperate now for some sign of my escape. Why couldn't I see the stairs? Why couldn't I see the light above them? Why was everything so black? So unbelievably, desperately black? And then my hand, reaching, grasping, desperate for anything to hold on to, came to rest on something made of cloth, but firm, Something heavy. Something unyielding. And then my nose was filled with the scent of lilac perfume when I realized I was touching a shoulder inside a cotton dress. I don't remember leaving the cellar. I just remember being in the living room where the diary was. And then I remember being outside in the backyard where there was an old oil drum filled with bits of wood and paper. I stared at the diary as it went up in flames, 
Wondering if I should still tell my family. Wondering if they would believe me or if it would even do any good. Deep down, I knew it wouldn't. I knew this was my secret alone. I don't know what it was that I encountered in that basement, but as I watched that diary burned, I was filled with an overwhelming sense of relief. And all in a rush, I saw everything from her side. The horrible sin. The terrible years of holding a grudge, nursing it, fanning it, keeping it alive. And then realizing, maybe not until after death, that the grudge was your only legacy. With the diary gone, I bore the memories alone. Well, not quite alone. As I turned to go back into the house, the scent of lilac perfume wafted in on the wind. Just short of the door, I reached into my pocket. And there in the pocket of the jacket I'd been wearing off and on for days, I felt the cold sensation of silver against my fingers. And I smiled and I sighed and I brought the missing brooch out of my pocket into the rays of the cold early spring sun. <laughs>